Our reading from Acts chapter 13 today is a key moment in the life of Paul and in the life of the early church. This was the moment when the church in Antioch sent Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary tour. It was in this moment, in that event, when the prophet and teacher who was Paul became an apostle. Scholars have worked on the timeline of Paul's life, and this time was nearly 20 years after Jesus had been raised from death after being crucified. Paul had been a young man at that time, and now was in his prime middle age, say about 35. I know, I'm well past that myself. <laughs> Paul, whose original name was Saul, was one of the five teachers and prophets who were the leaders of the church in Antioch. Barnabas was one of the other leaders. He had been the one who had fetched Paul from his hometown of Tarsus to come and help them at Antioch. They had been with them for more than a year, and the church was now well established with three other leaders. As they were worshipping God on a day of fasting, the Holy Spirit said to them, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. An apostle is someone who is sent. Paul and Barnabas had no idea of what God would accomplish through them. They just knew where they were to go. And as they went, the Holy Spirit led them step by step. The first place they went to was Cyprus in the northeast of the Mediterranean Sea. Nothing of note is recorded by Luke, the author of this book, until Paul and Barnabas reach Paphos at the far end of the island. The Roman proconsul, the governor of the island, is Sergius Paulus. Luke describes him as intelligent, which probably means that he was an educated man who read books such as they were in those days and enjoyed discussion and debate. He had heard about Paul and Barnabas and wanted to know more. But a Jewish prophet warned him off and opposed Paul and Barnabas. Paul is filled with the Holy Spirit and denounces Elimus the Jew, proclaims a penalty of temporary blindness upon him. Immediately, Elimus becomes unable to see and holds out his arms for someone to lead him away. We don't know what happened after that, although the proconsul is described as becoming a believer. We don't know if others gathered around him to form a fellowship. I'm not aware of any other references to a church at Paphos. Paul and Barnabas didn't stay long. And from Paphos they headed back to the mainland, but without John Mark, who had accompanied them that far. We think that this John Mark, a cousin of Barnabas, was the main author of Mark's Gospel. We have 12 of Paul's letters written to various churches and people long after this story here. They form a significant part of the New Testament, helping us to understand the life and the teaching of the early church. Without them, our understanding would be less. This journey of Paul and Barnabas shows us God's desire for the church to keep on growing and reaching out. It wasn't enough for the church in Antioch to be satisfied with how things were going there. The Holy Spirit spoke into their gathering and the church stretched out beyond their existing boundaries to help others to know about Jesus and the love of God. When opposition came upon them, the Holy Spirit told them what to do and what to say, and the church grew. As we continue to read through Paul's letter to the Colossians, written some years later, after Paul had founded the church there too, Paul reminds them of his teaching about how to live in community community and fellowship with each other. Compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bear with each other's burdens and failures. And when there are complaints, then forgive each other, as God has forgiven you. This list is similar to the list of the fruits of the Spirit that Paul writes to the churches in Galatia, to the north of Colossae. He goes on to write about love being above all, which is similar to what he writes to the Corinthians in his famous hymn of love in chapter 13. 
Love binds everyone together in perfect harmony. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts as in a single body of people. Thankful to God, as we noted a few weeks ago that Paul wrote to the church in Philippi too. Paul encourages the Colossians to let God's word live within us, to treasure what the Spirit tells us as well as the words of Jesus that we have written in the Gospels. Teach and encourage one another to live in these ways that Jesus taught his disciples, singing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs of gratitude to God. Everything we do is to be done in the name of Jesus so that he gets the credit, the praise and the worship that he is due in thankfulness to God the Father. Paul wrote his letters to the Christian fellowships he had established because he couldn't go to be there with him, to be with them. He couldn't be everywhere at once, unlike the Holy Spirit. And some of the time Paul was in, in jail and unable to go anywhere. Yet Paul remained in touch with his people. He knew who they were. He sent messengers back and forth. The congregations were like the seeds that the farmer in Jesus' story sowed into the field. Some grew quickly and then died. <clears throat> Some never really got started. Some got choked as they got crowded out by weeds and thorns. But many seeds grew and flourished and produced tens and hundreds of seeds of their own, like the church in Antioch did in sending Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. The seeds were planted, and whether they grew or died was up to them. If they grew deep roots into God by his Holy Spirit, then they would bear fruit and many seeds. If they ignored God, then they would die, because we cannot be like Jesus without the Holy Spirit in us. Let us choose together to be like Paul and Jesus in the Holy Spirit. Amen.